This is going to hurt. The Truth Always Does was written to bring heated debate topics to the forefront of the so-called black communities throughout the United States of America, constructed for all levels of literacy to indulge in the conversations. Many of the subjects discussed in this book's purpose are to rattle the heads of the afraid, complacent, and oppressed people of these so-called black communities. Black Americans' time for being apologetic for their misfortunes needs to come to an immediate ceasefire. This is going to hurt, the truth always does, will do that. Welcome you to Dream Shakespeare's Radio with me, your host, Yaya Diamond. What's up, peoples? How you doing? It is a great day. Oh my gosh. I am telling you, I am a, I'm on a roll. I'm on a roll. Authors, 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 authors. You know, authors have the best imagination. They also do research. I mean, they really engulf themselves into their projects so much so that when they come out, everything that they did is real to them, regardless of whether it's fiction or if it's facts or if it's studies or if it's a, uh, you know, a new dictionary or a new Bible, whatever the case may be, they are in it to win it. And that's why I love my next guest. He is talking about something that you guys may just not want to talk about, but too bad because we're going to talk about it anyway. Thank you so much for being on the show. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm just going to go by my author name, Michael Ernest. And, um, I'm just, you know, I'm excited to be here and just, you know, get it rolling. That's right. Well, Michael Ernest, tell me about yourself and how did you know you were going to be writing or did you know it all? Well, a little bit about myself. I'm originally from New York. I moved to Philadelphia in around 2012, so my early 20s. And as far as writing, I went to Lincoln University, which is the first HBCU which uh, granted uh, degrees. And from there is kind of where I really got into, you know, just writing for basic essays and grades. And that just was a skill that I ended up getting, but didn't realize I had until I was out of school many, many years later. Isn't it amazing how you don't realize how good you are until later? <laughs> I wish I knew earlier. I mean, if we knew earlier, we would be so much further along, but we don't know. But that's okay, because you did it. So what made you go into this? I mean, you know, I know you took the studies. I know you went to school. But some people, they get the degree, and they don't even end up in the same career field. Well, that, that's a great question in that aspect, because there was a particular point in, in my life in 2019 where I just got, you know, staggering with my career. And then I was just thinking, like, all right, I did all the schooling. I got my my bachelor's degree, I got my master's degree, and I don't really feel like I have anything to show for it. And, you know, education, as far as the benefits, it really varies based off of what you go into. So for example, I was a criminal justice major, and that can provide a job. However, it's not a necessity to get into, you know, law enforcement jobs, or just anything in criminal justice. However, if I were to went to you know, more of a specialized degree where I had to get a certain type of board certification, like a doctor or do some type of residency, then I feel like education, I wouldn't have been as, you know, upset with my, my education. So I was just thinking one day for, for, for many, many, uh, many months, like I did all that school and I did all these essays and I don't really have anything to show for it. You know, I did all these papers just to submit a grade and that was it. I got the grade. I passed the class, but that wasn't it. So as I was just thinking for this whole time, like some of these Ivy League schools or these more prestigious schools, they actually promote their students to uh, publicize their work, put it for actual publication. And I was like, you know what? I got all these thoughts in my mind already. And I have this background in Black studies. And just the combination of that, I was like, you know what? I'm going to do what I was actually doing all these years in school was writing and I'm going to actually publicize my own work. Nice. I mean, it takes a minute to kind of grasp the whole concept of I can do this. This, this needs to be done. This yeah. needs to be done. And okay. So you have your book and we're going to be talking about that now. You know, it's, this is going to hurt. The truth always does. Why that title? 
that title was meant to be, you know, when you pick up the book or just look at the copy of the book, um, it's just, I wanted it to be bold and just, everybody has a different type of truth. So just the title, I wanted it to be able to grab somebody that's walking by, you go into a bookstore or you see something online, you know, it's hard to grab somebody's attention. So I wanted, you know, this is going to hurt. And I want people to actually think about what is going to hurt. And then I'm following up with another, uh, the truth always does. So I just wanted to grasp, you know, the audience or a potential buy, a buyer um, about the information that's in this book is going to hurt. And I'm being very objective from the front cover of what I'm saying in this book. I wanted it to be right in the front. I hear you. And it does hurt. It does hurt. It hurts for people to actually, and, and we're going to get into that really quick. You know, the biggest thing that I think, it, did you cover where it hurts because you may be the best person in the world, take off your shirt for the next person, help them pay their rent, their mortgage, buy them groceries. Uh, there might be so many different things you do, but someone will look at you and because of the color of your skin, they say you're a bad person or they don't like you. I agree hundred percent. And you know, pulling back, you know, sticking up your shirt, like you said, and doing that for the next person, that there's so many different layers to that. And that's why in this book, I wanted to be that person to do that, to, you know, expose myself in writing where, you know, when you, when you write a book or you do anything where, you know, you're going to put words to paper, you're exposed to the world for your level of intelligence or your creativity. So, even writing this book was hurtful because now like everything that I'm saying, I'm putting it out there. So I definitely agree with that. Mm -hmm. So what are you putting out there? What is the main objective of your book? I mean, I, I, I know that it's discrimination because I mean, I, I kind of got that from, you know, the synopsis on Amazon, but tell me what you really want the reader to get from this book. So when I want this, primarily the book was written for, African Americans. I want to make that very clear. However, it's going to take the support of every group and every person, you know, to to all come together at the end of the day and just make this world a better place with, you know, just being kind to one another and just looking out for other person. But I want to bring to the forefront to Black Americans in this book topics that we do not speak about. You know, we're at the bottom of the social class. Um, economics, every class, if you just type in or Google, you know, Black people, we always come at the bottom. So I want to bring some, some truths and some discussions that we don't talk about. You know, we could talk about police brutality. We can talk about, you know, slavery. We could talk about our history and all those things are important and they matter. And they did bring us to the place that we're currently at. However, there are some things that we can do currently to this day to fix our position. And I discuss four major points and that's gonna be economics within the black community. It's gonna be child support. It's gonna be breastfeeding and the servitude that we're currently in in this country. And in each one of those points and chapters, we're gonna discuss about the different ways. We're gonna first analyze what the problems are in each one of those. And we're going to come up with, and you're going to see solutions to those problems. And then that is going to be a road to getting us from that bottom scale, be more respected in this country and just put us in a better position moving forward for our children, grandchildren to just moving forward. I agree with you. And it's so funny that you brought up breastfeeding. Um, I'm going to ask you why you brought up breast, breastfeeding and then I'll, I'll kind of go into the reason why I think you brought it up, but go ahead. Tell me why you brought up breastfeeding. So this is a great time for breastfeeding. I mean, not so for getting formula. That's actually like horrible right now. But when I wrote this book, this was before that I, uh, I just had a, uh, a son and I wanted to be able to get more information about breastfeeding and as I was trying to find out information, trying to, I never knew what a lactation was. I didn't know about latching. I didn't know about, you know, uh, skin disease and all these different things related to breastfeeding. And cracking, don't forget cracking. Yeah, cracking. absolutely. 
And all these different things is just one of the points that's a hard truth that we don't educate ourselves on as a people as far as breastfeeding. And it's so important because our health makes us, you know, if you breastfeed, for example, you have a higher chance of not getting eczema. Black people, we have the highest eczema in the country and it correlates with us breastfeeding less. And that's because we have not that much education. If we was have more education, more mothers and fathers together would have the discussion and then the numbers can go up and then we could possibly reduce eczema just for one example of breastfeeding. Yes, yes, that is a big deal. I mean, I, I had eczema uh, before I had my first son, my, my son actually, and I breastfed. And my skin has been so pretty after that. I haven't had one pimple. I haven't had one bump. I haven't had one problem. My skin has been flawless, flawless. Yes. But that's not the only reason. I think that um, people don't realize that breastfeeding correlates with uh, brain development. It correlates yes. with the good fat that goes into your child because that, and it also breastfeeding has the antibodies. So your body as a mother detects when your baby's sick and your body develops antibacterial uh, formulas within itself. And then when the baby drinks it, guess what happens? You're feeding your baby the medicine that they need to get well. Yes, that golden liquid, that's exactly what it is. And all mm -hmm. those uh, points that you discussed, that's actually in the book, just you know, awareness, you know, that awareness alone, if you, like, what you just said is so perfect. If that was said to, or promoted more, like how everything else is promoted, that's not good information for us, you know, it would, it would just help overall. Yeah. Yeah. It would encourage. And even if you, even if you don't like breastfeeding, but you want to pump, get some breast milk, uh, to your child. You know, if you're not able to breast, some people are not able to breastfeed. There are mothers out there that do pump and that's better than getting the formula because yes. I don't believe that my child needs to be drinking milk because that's for the calf. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a, I'm not a cow. You know what I mean? I'm a human. And so my baby should, and that was the biggest thing too. If we go back to slavery, because I know we were talking about that a second where we're always talking about that. But if we go back to slavery, they had, they had the, the black women become the, what the caretakers of their oh. children. And what did they make those black women do? Breastfeed. breastfeed their kids for the wet nursing so That's we right. were so it was and you could you could have a baby you know you can still produce breast milk after you have a child for many times so the mother would just go from baby to baby many years after she delivered her own baby and still breastfed other races children yep that's our history and we was the number one producer of breast milk but now looking forward 200 years later, we're at the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think education is going to be the biggest thing. And I like what you've put in your book. Also, what else would, would you, do you get across in that book? I know finances is a big thing. I mean, we find that a lot of people are using different methods of financing that we have been shut out of. Yes. So I usually ask, I like to ask people the question, how many times do you think a dollar bill circulates in a community. Like how many times if you get paid, you have $1, how many times do you think that dollar bill in a so-called black community circulates before it leaves that community? If you want to answer that, you can. How many times do you think it circulates before it leaves the community? Maybe one time, okay. maybe, maybe. Most of the time I would say it doesn't. Yes. And that was a hard question. That kind of started, you know, my research with economics in the so-called Black community. And that's a horrible number because if we look at, for example, the Jewish community, the Asian community, Italian community, sometimes that $1 circulates 30 times yeah. before it leaves. It hits 30 different businesses. It hits 30 different establishments before it leaves. So we have so much money as a people, billions and billions of dollars, we sent to so many different businesses and we just give the money away. 
So if we have more control and literacy of our economics, we'll have sovereignty over our money and we'll be able to develop our own institutions. We'll be able to help one another when we're sick. We'll be able to, you know, have our own daycares in a way of, you know, not hurting mm-hmm. the parents. So many benefits of us having control of our economics. Yeah. I think because we don't have businesses and we take our money elsewhere, you know, I am a big advocate on you need to be doing what you need to be doing so that I could do what I can, what I have to do. My, my, my adherence to what I need to do, like right now, I'm sitting here, I'm doing this show and you're on the show. What if I didn't adhere to my calling? What if I didn't he- adhere to the thing that I know I need to be doing, but I'm doing something different. Guess where that money would not circulate to another black person, but it would circulate to where? It would go to somebody else. Excuse me. Right. right. So literally what I'm saying is a lot of black people in their own communities, we don't have enough businesses to keep it circulating there. And then we have an influx of other people coming into our business and taking that money away from us, like the Chinese stores. And, you know, we need to go to the soul food store or we need to learn how to cook Chinese. It's one or the other. It's like, okay, black Chinese. Yeah, there are black Chinese people. You know, um, we need to take it to the laundromat that's owned by a black person. We need to buy black, keep it in the neighborhood, keep it circling, purposely looking for different black people to invest in an investor. I mean, these are the ways that we can actually do this. But, you know, laziness and just the convenience of having someone else do it for us is where we're at right now. Yes. And then to add on to that, you know, just simply pride, you know, I in this book and on my research, I asked a lot of women, I said, where do you go get your nails done? And you know, they'll mostly say Asian establishment. And then I said, can you tell me, can you ask next time you go get your nails done, ask the technician or whoever does your nails that you've been going to for years, do they know your name? You tip them every time you go, you go Mm -hmm. back faithfully. And I just think that that respect and pride as a people, which we lost, you know, should go a long way. You know, we should have, it's a business relationship where you go and spend your money, that establishment, they should know your name. You know, we shouldn't have to be able to go to, you know, get Chinese food and there's a glass window in between and you have to slot everything through. Now, I know some people say, you know, it's for their safety, but at the end of the day, I still want to be treated, you know, fairly. You know, I don't want to have to, you know, hurry up and buy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And be, and be followed. Yes, absolutely. I, 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 <laughs> I hate that. Yeah. I absolutely hate it. And it happens so often. It does. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you on that. And, and, you know, I don't get my nails done. I don't want people touching my nails. <laughs> my nails look very ragged right now um, because I just don't like it. I'm a dirt girl, but you know, it's like, I understand where you're coming from, but at the same time, we need to adhere to our callings. So if you are looking to do a business in your neighborhood, look at your neighborhood. The biggest thing I'm thinking of is we need to be creative, you know, creative financing. We, if we finance each other, we can get what we need. Yes. And, and diversity. Uh, I'm just going to show one of, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, here in the book, I ha- have an illustration that I made uh, to see this clearly. So here we need diversity as far as mm. our businesses. Yeah. And we shouldn't have four or five beauty salons, barbershops on the same block. Yeah. Or a five block radius. You know, I like the Jewish community as far as looking at them, how they, how they establish communities because They have correctiveness. They construct a business based off what's needed and not healthy competition is good, but they're not going to have barbershop number four or five when, you know, they're going to need an automobile place or they're going to need whatever industry they need Mm -hmm. to work with the other businesses to make that whole community thrive and then overall win versus us having two, three, a fried chicken spot if we have if, if we own it beauty salon barbershop 
I mean, that, that's pretty much it. We, we do have some other businesses, but it's not in cohesiveness. Right, right, right. And I agree with you. There should be a place where you can invest your money. There should be a black owned bank on the neighborhood. There should be a barbershop and there should be a nail salon and there should be a grocery store and there should be mom and pops, you know, chicken, fried chicken, whatever, you know, and even a, a black owned Chinese store. I mean, you know, I've seen it. I've seen it, you know, so it's like, yeah, we need to be more diverse. And then maybe three or four blocks down the block, we have another one. There you go. You see what I'm saying? Because literally, I mean, we need to think that way. And I don't think that people are thinking that way. I think they're just thinking of what they want to do. If there is a black owned barbershop or salon and they're next to each other, then don't create one there. Create one about four to five blocks down that will keep the money circulating. And when you come back to your neighborhood, put that money into your own neighborhood, into the hands of the people who live there and, and literally keep it within that neighborhood. You know, I mean, I love it. I love it. And your book, man, I'm telling you, this is going to teach us all how to do this. Yes. And just that last point that you said about like neighborhoods, this is why throughout the book, little spoiler, but I say the so-called black community, because we don't really have a community, you know, as black people in populated areas, but if we define what a community is, you know, having the same interest and just overall creating an establishment and controlling our finances, controlling, you know, us being in charge of our school curriculum, in charge of our police departments, in charge of our far, uh, pharmacies and medicine, you know, these establishments are through all throughout the country. The Italians have it, Asian Americans have it, so on and so forth. You come into our community, you'll have the CVS, you have the McDonald's, you have uh, the notaries, you have the police departments. We're not Kentucky in Fried Chicken, McDonald's, Wendy. Absolutely. But at the head of all these organizations, <laughs> yeah, it's not you don't have any representation. Right. Even in an elected positions, like, you know, we, we it's good that we keep seeing over and over again the first black, the first black, the first black. But at the local level, it's not there. No, no, no. And, you know, I've been, I've been thinking about a few different things and hopefully I can put some stuff into place where people will actually catch on because I do believe that we can help each other. No matter how much money you make, there's always some way creatively to get your dream into fruition. And I think that we need to think about that. Um, you, I mean, Tell me, what's the name of that book one more time? The name of the book is This Is Gonna Hurt, The Truth Always Does by Michael Ernest. We need to check that book out. Yes, absolutely. It's on Amazon. And, you know, there's a YouTube page. Just type the name in. Everything's going to come up. We're going to try to get this book out there to as many people as possible. Just, you know, because these topics are very important. And a lack of awareness, lack of knowledge is causing us as a people to suffer. And as a black man living through this country, this is just my contribution to help us out. You know, just take some time, read what you can, pass it over to the next person, and this should be able to liberate us. Definitely. I want to thank you, Michael, for being on the show. I appreciate it. We're going to have all that information about Michael's book in the description box below so that it'll be easy for you guys to go ahead and grab that and look into it yourself. Man, I tell you, you know, this was a, a big topic and we just touched the, the tip, <laughs> the, the very tip. It's like as if there is no cherry yet. It's just the tiniest little, because there's just so much that we could talk about. But the biggest thing is we're talking about it. So continue the conversation in your neighborhood. Continue your conversation with other people who are like-minded and let's help each other to get ahead. Again, thank you guys so much for tuning in and don't forget to dare to be different. Until next time, guys. Bye. Yeah.
Thank you.